Welcome to Foundstone Conversations. I'm Andrew Bird. And in this episode, we're fortunate to be speaking with the one and only Roger Martin, who's been named the world's number one management thinker by Thinkers50. He's a trusted strategy advisor to, to CEOs of companies worldwide, including Procter & Gamble, <clears throat> Lego and Ford. He's a former dean of the Rotman School of Management, an author now of 13 books, the latest one, a new way to think. So a very warm welcome to the show, Roger Martin. Thanks. It's great, uh, great to be on it, Andrew. Really appreciate you making some time. Now, Roger, I wanted to, to jump straight in and set the scene and turn to a couple of quotes in the book, if, if I may. Sure. Uh, the book was, was I read it over the last couple of weeks in, in prepping for the conversation with you. And it's, it's really distilled down. It was music to my ears. Uh, I was kind of saying hallelujah for some of the chapters, the way you've articulated. So there's a quote there, I think, sums, sums up the context of the book and, and, and broader. And that is, I don't believe there are right answers or wrong answers, just better ones and worse ones. It's extremely difficult and socially risky to question an established model that many people believe and start to and start building a new model from scratch. Now, to me, offering better answers and having a having a huge impact while you're doing that is exactly what you've been doing, giving back to the strategy community and the broader business landscape. And it's it's been giving myself personally, and I know a lot of our broader customers and partners, giving the courage to help them start to lean in and carve through some of the traditional strategy myths. So I, want for, I just wanted to thank you for that, for the work you've been doing over, over the last number of years and, and the latest book, because I really think it's, it's it's making some big breakthroughs. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's that's why I write them, uh, to be useful. It's uh, it, it's certainly certainly doing that. So so to kick us off, at the risk of sounding sounding a bit cheesy, we, we went out to some of our audience and asked them what they would love to hear from you. Mm. I haven't heard you been asked this question directly, but simply, simply, why do you do what you do? And how have you been able to build the resilience over so many years to continually break through the traditional strategy rule book? It's a, yeah, it's a good question. Nobody has asked me that exactly. I mean, I guess I would say I have as a motivation, probably I'm, I'm motivated like uh, many sons or daughters of elementary school teachers. So my, my mom, uh, my late mother was a uh, ele elementary school teacher in a public school. And I think she instilled a desire to teach and explain. She was always interested in me learning things and getting to th understand things better. And so I think a bunch of that rubbed off on me. Um, and I guess I always, I, I, my father also, if I would just go to family of origin stuff, my, my father um, was an entrepreneur uh, and he's still with us. Uh, uh, my older brother runs the company that uh, my dad founded. Um, and he, he never seemed very accepting of the conventional wisdom in his industry. He would say, I know, I, I know, like I would say, dad, why are you doing this? And he'd say, yeah, I know other people do it this other way, but I don't think that's that's right. I, I don't think that's the best way to do it. Uh, here's what customers really care about. And so we should think about it this way. So I think I was in, in some sense encouraged to teach and share by my mother and encouraged to challenge kind of conventional wisdom by my father. And my dad was always very good about explaining to me when I asked him a question, um, so this was the animal feed uh, business. So we manufactured Wallenstein Feed and Supply Limited, or the family company man uh, manufactured animal feed. And uh, dad had principles. And so uh, one of them was uh, you never, ever, ever negotiate on price. You have a price list every week because the prices of the raw ingredients, you know, corn and soybeans, uh, uh, change all the time. You can't have a constant price, but every Monday morning you issue a price list for that week. You print it up. The salespeople, when they're calling on farmers, they hand the price list to the farmer, and that's the price. And the company's been going for 
I guess, uh, uh, 64 years. Uh, and, um, and I'm quite sure we've never deviated from the price in any situation ever. And I would ask dad, I, I'd say, well, dad, you know, that seems a bit rigid. Uh, what if, uh, because you hand it to the farmers, that gets around, right? Our competitor could just get the list and go to a farmer and underprice uh, that. And wouldn't you want to respond and match? You know, I think a reasonable question. And dad would, uh, Dad said, I remember very, very clearly, Dad said, well, Roger, you know, I start with, well, Roger. Well, Roger, um, here's the way I see it. I think we want to compete on the basis of the quality of our feed, uh, and the quality of our service, because the farmers uh, had animals and they always need veterinary support and 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 advice, et cetera. So service and support, that's what we're going to win on. And we have a great cost structure. We don't think anybody has actually got a cost structure better than uh, better than ours. And so um, if we want to have the conversation be about uh, service and support and quality, um, if we hand out the price list at the start of the of, of the sales call, and they are fully confident that there's never going to be a ton of uh, a feed sold at below that uh, price list, then um, the entire conversation will be about quality, service, and support. If instead they think price is up for negotiation, the entire sales call will be about price negotiation. Um, so, so I want. I want them to be certain that there, there is no utility in talking about the price because it just is, is what it is. But I pushed him on and I said, dad, dad, you know, but still, if somebody just underprices us at a really good uh, customer of, of ours, you know, wouldn't you want to just follow that price down and, and get that customer back? And he said, well, Roger, as always, um, <laughs> we, um, and that's not the customer we should be going at because if our cost structure is as good as our competitors or better, I think it's better, but it's at least as good. If they're underpricing that customer, they're only being able to do that by overpricing some other customer. Our job is to find that other customer and sell us on the price list where we'll, where we'll win there. And then our competitors will understand that <laughs> trying to win by underpricing uh, Wallenstein feed and supply won't work. So that is a model, right? He had a model, which was you treat customers with respect, you focus the salesperson's effort on what you want to differentiate, my words, not his, but differentiate on the, on the basis of, and you've got to stick with it uh, because by sticking with it, you provide that confidence that they know that they uh, uh, can't get a deal and nobody else is going to get a better deal than them. Those are all parts of a model that's very different than most B2B sales. It's sort of like, hey, how sharp a price can you get us? It's all about the pricing, all about the pricing. And he just said, you know, that, that hits you in not a good long-term direction. So we need, we need to have a set of principles that will cause customers to have confidence get what they need and, and, and want and not, not waste a lot of effort on, on stuff that we don't want to have happen. So I think mm. <laughs> growing up with that, it was sort of like, don't accept how it's done if there's a better way. Uh, and your job is to teach others. I guess I answer a too, probably too long answer to your very good question. It would be those those two things together probably shape what I spend my time thinking about and doing. That's, Makes sense? That's, that, that, that's beautiful, Roger. And, and thank you for taking us back to those early days <clears throat> because it, it gives us some real context about, you know, you're talking about, you know, your, your late mother and your father and your brother and the feed and supply business and those principles you talk through, you know, quality service support as opposed to price. And then the you know respect differentiation and then sticking with it, and that's and that's still very much I mean the the content you're producing on Medium etc. There's a consistency to it, and there's a there's a levelness to it that really resonates with uh, with, with myself and so so thank you for sharing that it, it does does build a lot of context it's really helpful. 
Good, good. It's a pleasure. And I'm glad you read the medium uh, stuff. I, I, I've really enjoyed this, this series, this Plain to Win Practitioner Insights uh, series. I mean, it did, it did not start with a big plan. I just uh, you know, wrote a piece in response to somebody's question about management systems and the feedback was, you know, so, so positive. I said, well, I guess people are interested in it. And, and I think was Monday morning. Monday morning was nine, number 95. Yeah. So, number 95. Uh, wow. Yes. Well, yes. It's, it's certainly got that, again, that feel to it. It's not this, you know, pre-structured thing. It, it feels very live and living that it's, yeah. it's very, very t for the times, you know, we're moving into uncertain times. Um, it's got a real feel for, for relevance. So, so thank you for that. Not at all. And, and if you've got questions, I encourage people, the last few have been directly answering uh, questions. The, the one on Monday uh, that we just, uh, just put out uh, was an answer to a question from a student of mine who just emailed me and said, what about this? Well, what are the skills strategist needs in this uh, wild world? And, uh, and so it's a good, it's a good motivator for, uh, for me to answer a question. I mean, some questions that come in, I say, ah, I think that's a little idiosyncratic. I don't think that mm -hmm. generally people would like that. And I often just try to answer it briefly on the side. But if I think, you know what, I, I bet a lot of people are thinking about that same thing, then, then I will uh, happily uh, spend, uh, spend part of the week writing something up. I see. Well, that's brilliant. It definitely comes across. So so really appreciate that. If we if we dive now straight into you know, one of the chapters, and it's been you've written on it uh, in the past, and and that is a plan is not a strategy. And mm. your recent clip on Harvard Business Review, I see it's nearly already ticked over the the million views. Yes, it's amazing, isn't it? It's just it's mm. gone viral. It has, and I really do, Roger. Looking at that, the way you've framed that, the timing of it, I know it's not the first time you've framed that. But I really do think that we're going to be looking back on that clip and that and this 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 kind of moment, this time where you've positioned this as a real major turning point with a large cohort of people. Because I feel, you know, that that clip it in a good way, it ruffled a few feathers, you know, over the traditionalist. And that says yes. to me that is getting really good breakthrough. So I really do think that that is that is going to be a turning point. We're looking back at that in, in years to come of what strategy really is. And again, of not falling into that strategy plan or planning trap, sorry. Yeah. So can you talk us through, just to go back to those fundamentals of the clear difference between strategy and planning? And yes. what do you think, you know, people have often kind of got caught in that planning trap? Sure. So I, I guess the, there's a couple of really important distinctions between strategy and planning. And uh, and strategy, strategy is... is uh, focusing on outputs and planning is focused on inputs. So people love planning because it tends to be about the things that you control, right? How much are we going to spend on what are we going to spend? Who's going to spend it, uh, et cetera. Those are all things that we control. What product are we going to launch? And and so you can feel all very good about having followed your plan, right? Plans tend to be quite doable, right? Because they focus on the things that are in your control that you're going to do. Strategy, on the other hand, focuses on outputs. Here's the position that we are striving to achieve in the marketplace. If we go back to my father, it was we want to be seen as the high quality, high service uh, dependable, trusting, uh, trusted company. Uh, that's an output. You don't control that, right? Farmers decide in that case, if you are high quality, whether their animals are growing the way they, they wish, high service, you come and help them when their animals are, are sick or not growing as fast as you, you think they, they, uh, they should, and you're reliable, you always, you always deliver. Those are outputs that will be decided by the customer, and they will decide on the basis of that whether to buy your stuff or not. So that is, is more intimidating for some people who are more sort of bureaucratic, technocratic in, in mind, where they say, well, that's not in my control, so I'm not going to say anything about that. 
but I'm going to do these things. I'm going to ask the manufacturing people, how many plants do you want to build? I'm going to ask the finance people, how many dollars do you want to spend? I'm going to ask the HR people, how many people do you want to hire? And we'll put together a plan that has all these things in it. And they typically, plans typically sound sensible. There's typically, you don't read a plan and say, well, that's stupid. Like, why the hell would you do that? I, I, I don't see that very often. It's often a list of things that appear laudable. But the question is, do they induce together as a set of choices, as an integrated set of choices, do they induce com com uh, customers to take the actions that you would want them to take? And that's strategy. Uh, and that's harder. Uh, because you don't control it. You have to compel uh, customers. So you have to spend, and in, in the case of dad, you're going to compel customers in part by having a great sales force who instead of spending the whole sales call negotiating price like the competitor salespeople because they it's whatever you can negotiate with the salesperson and whatever the salesperson thinks they can get away with giving you as a hot, a, a hot price, right? Uh, they'll spend all their time on that. We'll spend all our time explaining here's here's how we formulate the fear. Here's all the testing that, that, that we do to make sure that it's the right uh, food at the right time in the animal's animal's life. And here's what we'll do uh, when you when you need uh, uh, problems. So by having that strategy that says this is how we want to be positioned, you actually compel the customers. The customers find you compelling uh, with your offer uh, to them. So that's that's to me the the big difference, and it's harder and scarier. <laughs> There's no no two no two ways uh, about it. And this is this is why lots of people just want a plan because they can go to their board and say, "You approved our plan, right? And we did everything we said in the plan." And look what happened. We didn't get the sales we thought. There were these, this competitor did this thing that we didn't expect, or the economics weren't very good uh, out there. The economy sort of uh, was in a bit of a contraction. And, you know, what, what are we to do? Because we did everything. And, and they want to be patted on the back to say, oh, you poor people, uh, you worked so hard. Uh, you know, uh, how can we fault you? Your effort was entirely there and, uh, and you're right. Um, but that, and as I say that in 499, I'll buy you a decaf latte at Starbucks, right? It's, it's not, uh, most plans simply are not worth the paper they are printed on. Uh, and that is why strategy is a, is a lost art. Uh, it, there's very few companies, unfortunately, that really uh, know what strategy is and pursue uh, strategy, pursue a set, a coordinative set of decisions that compel customers to do uh, the things that you would like them to do. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. I think the the part you mentioned, the frame around, you know, not being able to control and a plan feels like you've got more control is is definitely what we we see out there. Do you? Yeah. In your is practice, there, that, you see a lot of that as well in your practice. I think so. Yes, it is. I think it's you know the 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 picture you painted there of the boards and the exec team and feeling comfortable, and then kind of being able to bit, point a bit of a finger perhaps. Uh, is probably is probably a part of it as well. Um, I do think though, through you know, we're heading into more uncertain times. I do think people are lifting lifting their head a bit to say, hang on, if we if we really just depend on this plan, you know, the planning cycle now twelve months, people are kind of even questioning the length of planning cycles. So what what you articulated there around you know having control and acknowledging that you're not always in control because the customers make the decision. I think that's, you know, and a lot, lot of through your work is becoming more front of mind, which is good. Well, good. I'm glad. Yeah, I guess the way, and the way I think about it in, in planning too is, is to me, the revenue side and the cost side of the income statement, they're treated because it's on one statement as kind of all the same. Uh, but for me, if you just think of error bars, the error bars around costs are always narrower, right? Yes, costs can get a little out of control or there might be unexpected like transportation, these days transportation costs or raw materials costs. But since you make all the decisions, 
you should be pretty accurate on what you put on the expense side because you're the customer, as I say, you're the customer of your expenses. Who's the customer of your revenues? Other people. And so you blithely put down, well, it's going, our, our, our revenues are gonna be $4.6 billion uh, because we say so. We've asked our salespeople what we think we can, we can sell. And then we, then we treat that as as good a number as, uh, you know, whatever leasehold improvements this year or, or, or whatever. Uh, they're completely different. The, the, the error bars around revenues are huge, right? Those revenues will end up being, they can be nothing, right? If you've got a bad offering and somebody else has got a better, better offering. Uh, and so, so and, and frankly, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little bit extreme on this front. I, I think revenue forecasting is a waste of time, right? It, it's just a complete, a complete waste of time. Um, I mean, revenue forecasting is, is, is the moral equivalent of giving a pacifier to a crying baby, right? <laughs> it doesn't do anything actually, but just kind of mm. make them feel kind of comfortable because they got something in their mouth and they're sucking on it. That's the same as revenue forecasting. Oh, because we forecasted that it'll be 4.6 uh, billion. And then that'll re result in us making 27 cents per share. And that's what the market is uh, responding. Hooray, we can feel comfortable. No, you can't. You know, you just made that up, right? That's not in your control. You'll, you'll, you know, you'll figure out as you go through the year whether you've compelled $4.6 billion of revenues to show up or not. And that'll be completely dependent on how good a strategy uh, you have. Uh, so well, I, I, think I, that... I encourage people to be careful about wasting time on revenue forecasting. Well, that is that is very practical advice, and I think the the clip you know that you you framed and is getting getting so much traction. I think that in that example, revenue forecasting, I think the lights are, are slowly or quickly going on, because you know people have gone are going through those those many cycles and kind of realizing that it's not it's not that helpful. So um, I think it's it's very helpful to to put it like that. If we move yeah. to the topic of strategy and execution. <laughs> Now, uh, this is my most difficult subject side, but let's do it. Let's do it. Well, well, Roger, <laughs> I've heard you say that you know there's there's a few other topics where you where you sometimes question whether you'll see the change in your lifetime, but yes. I, I do genuinely believe even though even the last little while, and you know it's a lot of your content is 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 leading it. Is it, there's a bit of a shift and and people people starting to question this. So I want to turn just to a quote in the book. Sure. Uh, and that is most managers are so used to believing that strategy and execution are distinct from one another that they are blind to whether strategy and execution approach makes any sense. Yeah. Now, I love how you paint the picture, a uh, very clear picture, that staff don't want to be these choiceless doers, as you put it. Yeah. Yeah. And they're not just waiting, you know, with bated breath for the strategy to be revealed to then to go and execute like kind of robots so yeah. can you can you try to distill that down for us in and sure. maybe an example or two sure sure i mean i mean and one of the reasons that offends one of the one of my core rules of business which is the golden rule right do unto others as you would want them to do unto you do would you want somebody coming into your office and saying because i'm brilliant i have decided the strategy and now andrew um uh, all you have to do is execute my brilliance, right? And uh, and everything will be everything will be fine as long as you execute, right? Do you do you want to, do you want me to come into your office and 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 say that to you? No, that's demeaning. It's insulting. It's stupid. Uh, so if it's if if that's how you'd feel if somebody does it to you, why do you do it to them? But what's the, what's the the problem? The problem the problem is. The person executing has to do something, right? You're, you know, if they didn't do anything, then then you know the wheels of progress would would grind to a halt. There would be no reason for me to have come to your office to ask you to execute. You've got to do something. So it is really important for me, if you're you know kind of working for me, for me to know what I would like you to do, right? So I have to be sort of clear-minded about that. So let's say 
right? I don't know. Let, let, let's say let's say I'm John Moeller, the CEO of Procter & Gamble, and I'm talking to Alexander Keith, the wonderful head of the beauty business. And I say, you know, uh, here's my strategy, uh, Alexander. My, my, my strategy is uh, at, at the Procter & Gamble level is to be in these six businesses, you know, beauty and baby and, and laundry and home, six businesses. And we're going to sell those through the mass channels, mass merch, uh, grocery, uh, pharmacy, C stores, uh, and we're going to win on the basis of of branding. We're going to differentiate products and branding and R and D. We're going to understand consumers better to do R and D to have more differentiated products. Okay, so that's my strategy, which is which is the Procter and Gamble strategy. It's stated strategies, nothing inside. Um, and if you say to Alex, who runs a 15-ish, maybe it's 17 by now, billion dollar business, hair care, uh, skin care, any perspirant deodorants, a bunch of businesses under that. Now you just go execute my strategy. So what's what do you want Alex Keith to do? If you say I have done strategy, let's ask what you did. To, to make that John, uh, John Moore. Uh, well, he had, he had uncertainty about the future. He had competition. He had constraints, right? How much money he had, what the shareholders care about, what the regulatory framework is, what the macroeconomic conditions are. And he thought about those things and said, we're gonna do this stuff, not that stuff. Fair enough. Okay, so, What's Alex Keith supposed to do? Apparently, since we call it execution, and by the way, John Mulder doesn't, but, uh, but uh, um, uh, well, let's just say that he does the usual thing, which is to say, now you, now you, uh, you yeah. execute. It must mean it is doing something different than what John did, right? Otherwise, we'd use the same name for it because that's generally how language works. When it's exactly the same thing, we tend to use the same words to describe it. So she must not be making choices under uncertainty, constraints, and competition. She must be doing something else. What's she doing is, is the question I, I keep asking. If she's not doing that, so she's not making choices or Maybe she's making choices, but there's no constraints, uncertainty, or competition, or, or what? And the answer is, the only answer you can possibly come to, that at least I can, is, gee, you know, her choices seem remarkably similar to John's choices. She's got to decide, okay, we're going to stay in shampoos and conditioners and styling aids, mousses and gels, uh, skin care, uh, and uh, any perspirant deodorant as our three uh, uh, big businesses. And we're going to have to figure out how to win in, in very different ways in each of those businesses because they're different businesses with different characteristics. Um, um, now, because we're into branding, mass channels, uh, and, and innovation, uh, kind of led. We're, we'll, we need to do that because we need to be consistent with what he said. But man, do we have huge uh, choices. And then she says that the shampoo and conditioner uh, a, a person. So here's my choices. And now are you executing? No, no. You're figuring out how to win in head and shoulders, which is different than how to win in Pantene, which is different than uh, how to win in herbal essences, which is different than how to win in Aussie, uh, et cetera. So everybody, everybody all the way down is making choices under uncertainty, competition, and constraint. Why do we call it something different? And people give me these completely pathetic answers like, well, Roger, they're constrained, right? The choices at the top are unconstrained. And I'm like, okay, tell that to John Moeller and then run from the room. Like, you have no constraints, John. You can spend anything you want. The shareholders don't care. No, mm. he's got constraints. You've got constraints. They're nested, right? Alex Keith can't decide 
um, we are going to uh, compete on the basis of cost. We're going to do private label uh, to get maximum volume so we can get our costs down. All that R&D ain't doing it. All that consumer research ain't doing it, ain't spending. No, I mean, she can't do that. But you know what? If John Mueller said that to the shareholders, the shareholders would go crazy. They'd say, that's, that's not what you, that's not what you said. That's not what, that's certainly not what we bought a share of your, your stock uh, to, to turn the back on 200 years of, of, of success. Right. So, so yes. it, I would prefer if you're doing the same thing to call it the same thing. And what I think therefore is it is, you are much more effective as an executive if you make the set of choices that you were asked to make, John Mueller has a set of choices he was asked to make, Alex Keith has a uh, choice, uh, set of choices, the Pantene uh, uh, global brand franchise leader has a set of choices uh, uh, to make. They all have choices uh, uh, to make. So you should make the choices that you have been assigned to make and then charter the choices at the next level. And what I mean by charter the choices is to say, I need you, Alex, to make a set of choices that, that win in your fields, which are shampoos and conditioners, uh, skincare, any personal deodorant, in a way that's consistent with and reinforcing of what we're doing. Because we, we want to end up with the biggest R&D spend in our, in our industry because we're doing more innovation than anybody. And we want to end up with the biggest advertising spend in our industry because we want to have the strongest uh, brands. And we want to have uh, the mass distribution channels think of us as their most important uh, company. So you need to make choices that are consistent with those goals. But boy, are they choices and they're really important choices. Put your thinking cap on, Alex. I'll help you if you, if you, if you want. But you are making some serious strategy choices. Uh, and I'm depending on you for that. Which is more motivational? Alex, could you please execute my brilliant strategy? Or I'm depending on you to make fantastic strategy choices that will make the overall corporation better? I mean, it's a rhetorical question. Like it's just so obvious, which is gonna be more motivational to the, to, the, to the person that you're interacting with. It does, it seems so obvious when you paint that very clear picture like that, Roger. I know the, the example in the book, I think it was Mary, the, the, front, <laughs> the, front, the front teller in the bank. And you know, she was yes. making those, you know, those specific choices dependent on the, on the situation. Um, although, you know, probably questionably about how, how far that was filtering back up the chain. But I think that was an example. And the example you've talked through there with John and Alex at P&G, the, the empowerment that, that, that John would have given Alex, and, and then it switches it to a motivational perspective. I, I, I would have thought from Alex that she's not just yes. giving this kind of a broad brush thing, you do this. It's, it's an empowerment thing as well, isn't it? Yes, it is. And quite frankly, like, People used to, uh, to say in, in America, uh, at least, that General Electric was the CEO factory. More people went off to General Electric uh, to be CEOs right. than anyone else. It ain't even close. P&G is the factory. They were saying that when they were deciding, uh, you know, when GE was, Jack Welsh was deciding uh, between Jim McNerney, uh, um, um, oh God, what's his name? The, the, the forgettable, uh, forgettable, uh, the guy went to uh, Home Depot, and oh. and and the guy won won the race. Well, two of the three were actually P P and G people, right? So, so, so even at GE, it's P and G uh, people, but they're they're just all over there. And one of the reasons is P and G recognizes all the way down to the brand managers, and you know, and they have you know seventy brands. They've got twenty five or so billion dollar brands. They're strategists, so. Who do recruiters come and look for? They, they look for somebody who knows strategy and has actually been in charge of strategy, hasn't been, quote, executing somebody else's uh, strategy. So it, it ends up having an impact, I think, of making the people better. And part and parcel of that is P&G saying we promote from within. So they have no choice 
but to make people kind of better right. and make them ready for the top because they don't go outside and find somebody they they uh, they promote great people uh from from inside so who knows maybe some maybe someday but people people say oh well then you're talking about you're talking about strategic execution roger is that right and i'm like where right. did the execution word fit in in into there like it, it's it's so it's so in this one is so ingrained in people's mm -hmm. minds like it's so mm -hmm. incredibly ingrained that we that they can't can't envisage uh, a corporation and it's even more important in service businesses right so so in service businesses the person interfacing with the customer actually makes strategy choices every day as with mary the, the the teller example in the in in the book right her she is segmenting customers in real time and giving them different kinds of service not different qualities different kinds of service based on what segment that she's assessed them to be in uh i mean and and if she does that well customers without having any idea exactly why it just feels great right they say they would give they would give her her uh her, her bank uh great ratings on customer service uh and if you ask them why they won't say oh because they identified i was in segment two uh and gave me appropriate service they would say no they just it just works it's pleasant uh it's no must no fuss uh, I, you know it, it just works and so in businesses like that if you're telling them to execute if you're telling that frontline staff to execute and and as i tell as you know from reading it the story like when i asked mary about her her segmentation strategy and, and everything she was all excited about it and whatever and then and then like she got scared and, and i quickly quickly after when i asked her could you just show me in the teller manual uh where this tripartite segmentation scheme that you'd come up with and the differential service service uh, approaches and she's like oh my god I, i've been caught right because there's not a word about that in the in, the in the teller manual not yes. a word and and because she had done it on her own and then the, the sad question right is well mary have you talked to your your uh, manager about this and she says no i haven't roger he wouldn't be interested in all what a teller has to say right that's what you get when you've got this i'm the brilliant strategy person you're just the lowly execution person that execution person who's not lowly who's actually could be brilliant like mary uh, and dedicated like mary doesn't believe you have any interest in what's on her mind whatsoever so true if we just look at that in the terms of the language you are providing in my view a better model you're giving here's a better model and you're putting it out there it's it's definitely getting traction um so so you're you're doing that now which is which is fantastic when you look at you know uh, traditional business schools and i've heard you talk a bit about them and you know it's not about kind of you know kind of uh, getting stuck into them as such but in terms of the language we're using do you see any change I mean, I, I know of a few people in the in the higher education system and business schools that have recently left because they don't feel that business schools in Australia anyway are, are that in touch with where the market is going. I know you were Dean of Rotman School of Management and you you turned that around. Um, you, you now have your own uh, strategy course online, which I think is very much in touch with the market. Do you, do you see a shift in there or do you still see there's a long way to go in, in business schools? Yeah, it's more the latter um in fact i think i think um graduate business education not undergrad because there's at at the undergraduate level there's just this flow of 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 great young kids who want to get into the world of business and they'll take an undergraduate degree but the mba uh uh program as a program is in secular decline and that's happening i think first and most aggressively in the us which was the home of business education it's the most penetrated part of the world in terms of of uh, business uh, education and you know per capita kind of uh basis and and it hit a peak around 
2000, give or take a, a couple of, a uh, couple of years. And, and um, I think it's just going to go into, into a steep decline because the business schools do not have enough interest in uh, being uh, responsive to the market. Uh, and I, I think it's, it's very, it's very sad. Uh, you know, I, I got invited to give a talk to the world's biggest business nerd fest, the Academy of Management, which is what business school professors go to uh, kind of every year <laughs> on the future of the MBA in 2013 in my last year's dean. And I think it was because I was getting, a, you know, getting awarded the business school dean of the year and all this stuff. So I was sort of, a, a, you know, a cool, a cool person at the time. Um, and, uh, and I, my entire presentation was in comparing business schools in 2013. So when I gave a speech to General Motors in 1960, uh, and I, and I, and I showed General Motors in 1960 and onward and business education. And I just said, we're heading in the same direction as General Motors. Uh, and, and so, I wish I could be more optimistic about business education, but I just, I just am, am not. Uh, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, and it ain't even close. Is is turning around the Rotman School of Management. Um, I worked on taking tennis Canada, to, uh, tennis in Canada, from nothing to kind of uh, one of the, the envy of most countries in the in the world. I've you know kind of helped build Monitor from nothing to so, something. Uh, I, I've written all sorts of books. All of that is way easier than than moving uh, a business school, um, and so the it's going to have to get a, a lot worse before it gets better. And the interesting thing is that they have this diversification. So business, I I think undergraduate business education will remain strong because a kid wants, you know, an 18 year old or thereabouts wants to get an education in something they're interested in. Their opportunity costs are low, right? Uh, and they, uh, and so they're going to get four-year education in that. The MBA, right, starting with Harvard Business School, shot itself in the foot. So here's a little strategy. So the MBA uh, world shot itself in the foot. Uh, in the, uh, the, the uh, late 60s and 70s, uh, Harvard Business School uh, said, uh, we're going to create this deferred admit approach where we uh, admit you out of uh, senior year at college, uh, but on the basis that you go and work for two years before coming back. Right. And, and by the time I was in Harvard Business School in the late 70s, uh, about two thirds of my entire class were deferred. Right, they were people who who graduated two years earlier and had a had a job. Then Harvard Business School phased that out and said, "We don't want to clog up our admission system by having all these deferred admits. So we're going to get rid of the deferred admit problem uh, uh, program, but you have to have at least two years of work experience to compete to get in." Right. Then people said, "I need three or four years of work experience to have an impressive resume and great uh, reviews." And so what happened is the entire elite business education world, and I suspect the same would hold for Australia if you did the numbers, it's about four and a half years of work experience for, for the average, uh, average student. What has that done? Right? Mm. Raised the opportunity cost dramatically. Rather than as, a, as an undergrad going direct to business school, just like a lawyer's lawyers go direct from undergrad to business school doctors go from uh, medical students go from pre-med to medical school like me i was still in the era i was one of the people who went directly from undergrad to business school and my worldly profession possessions uh, uh, consisted of a couch a fish tank and a, <laughs> and a desk and a chair right yes. and i had i'd never had a regular paycheck i always worked in the summers but i'd never had a regular paycheck right and so the opportunity cost felt like zero Right and now, I had to pay business school a bunch of money, but other than that, it was zero. What if you're out four or five years and you're making, I don't know, maybe 60, 70, 80,000 uh, uh, bucks a year? You may have acquired a, a spouse um, in, in, in that period. So, your opportunity cost 
on top of the tuition, which has gone up dramatically, it's gone up at least eight times since I was in, in, in business school. So that's gone up eight times. And the opportunity cost has gone stratospheric, right? And for that, then you say, we're going to teach you what we want to teach you, not what the market uh, kind of values. Good luck in getting people to pay that total cost, opportunity costs, and, and, uh, and tuition, room board books. That's well over a quarter of a million now. It's probably more like 400,000 US in a, in a, a top 20 US uh, business school. I don't know what it is in, in Australia, but I bet it's at least two or 300 uh, uh, grand. I would, I would, I would uh, uh, mm -hmm. say you got to be good for that. You got to be good for that. And, and then you got guys like Peter Thiel and, you know, in Silicon Valley saying, take the 400,000 and invest it in a, in a, a startup. So business education is cruising for a very, very serious bruising. Well, I think, Roger, you're, you're providing a real alternative. I attended the, the, the Disco Roger Martin School of Business. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. The whole the networking with other strategists, business leaders globally was a huge uh, oh, you know, good. Part. So found it really helpful. Good. I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Um, just in, in, in essence of, and just in respect to your time, I just want to finish on a last yeah. question, if I could, Roger. Yeah, um, yeah, shoot, shoot. Around data. So data shouldn't be the default strategy uh, position in strategy. And like you explain through the teachings of Aristotle, that 100% of data, 100% of all data is about the past. Yes. Now, can you just, oh. just spend a minute, bit of a moment framing this? Sure. This sure, you've learned it well. Yes. So, so the yeah, the tricky thing about data is 100% of it is in the past. As of the time you analyze, it's in the past. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist yet. We have no data about the about the future. And the interesting thing is in your statistics course that you'd have taken as part of your your uh, your business education you are taught by a statistics professor who who will who will you know totally drive into your head the importance of having a representative sample of data if your sample of data is not representative of the universe it is dangerous to make assumptions so if you were if you were saying oh you know i'd like to figure out what uh, what people kind of care about in their electric vehicle in Australia, what, how, what, how Australians think about electric vehicles. Then you go out and interview a bunch of men or just interview a bunch of women or interview a bunch of young people or interview a bunch of old people and say, well, this is what Australians think, right? The statistics professor would go crazy. They'd say, Andrew, you're out of your mind. You can't extrapolate what men think into what Australians think or what women think into what Australians uh, think. You needed a random sample of old, young, rich, poor men and women. If you want to know what Australia, if you want to know what men, uh, men like in an EV, good, good on you. You've done it. Um, so they teach you that. So then you go to your, your finance class or your marketing class or your strategy class, and they say, well, you've got to make your decisions based on data analytics, right? Yeah, otherwise, it's a bad decision. Uh, so make sure you're doing rigorous data analytics. And so you're doing a strategy class and, and, or a marketing class, and you go out and, and do uh, a, a analysis of the, of the data. It has to be representative. So you say, yeah, yes, I've, I've, I've got a, a randomized sample of people of uh, electric vehicle buyers to, to determine my electrical, electric vehicle uh, strategy. Um, but you're determining your electrical, uh, electric vehicle strategy for when? The past? No, that's already happened. So you don't need a strategy for that. What do you need a strategy for? The future. So is your sample representative of the future? Hmm, well, it could be. If the future is gonna be identical to the past, then you're okay, you're, 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 you're good, right? But if I just ask you, Andrew, about electrical, electric vehicles, how confident are you that the future will be identical to the past in electric vehicles? How confident are you? 
Right? <laughs> Not at all. Not in fact, the about. only thing you're confident about is it's going to evolve in ways we don't really understand uh, uh, yet, and it'll be different from from uh, uh, from the pr present. Mm -hmm. So your stats professor in your stats course at business school would say, if you're taking that data and deciding what to do in the future, you're making a fundamental data analytics error, a, a terrible one, just a dangerous one, because the danger is you have no idea how it's going to be different than the, than the past. And all it'll do is make you confident that you've had a data-based uh, answer. So this is the fundamental schism at business schools. Your strategy professor is telling you to do something that your statistics professor would say is insane and insane and dangerous. Um, and, you know, I'm not the guy who pointed this out. Right? The guy who pointed this out was Aristotle 2,500 years ago, who said, you know, there's two parts of the world. There's a part of the world where things cannot be other than they are, right? And I always describe that part of the world as I have this pen in my hand. If I let go of it, what's going to happen? It's going to fall. It fell last week. It's going to fall next week. It's going to fall in Australia. It's going to fall in Florida. It's going to fall, uh, you know, anywhere. And it's going to keep on falling. Why? It's because... It's in what Aristotle kind of coolly and cleverly called the part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. So what's the cool thing about that? If we do a, do a test of a thousand pen falls in the past, is that representative of pen falls in the future? Sure as hell is because, because it's part of the world where things cannot be other than they are. And so he said in that part of the world, the guy who invented science says, use science to make your decisions about the future because the past is a perfect predictor of the future. He said, but there's another part of the world. It's a part of the world where things can be other than they are. And that part of the world tends to be the part of the world in which kind of people interact with one another and think together, do things together and make decisions. We could call that if we wanted the world of business. Uh, and he said, in that part of the world, don't ever use data analytics to make your decision. Not, well, you got to be careful and you got to modify it and whatever. No. No. Pretty, pretty, pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty direct. Mm. Yeah. And there he said, I think interestingly, and this is why I think, and I think you're interested in this too, Andrew, if I'm, if I'm uh, remembering some of your comments in class, this is why the world of design has become so important in business. Because what Aristotle said is in that part of the world, you must imagine possibilities and choose the one for which the most compelling argument can be made, right? And so what do you do if you go to design school for four years instead of business school? You are taught over and over again until you're probably sick of it to imagine possibilities and then make an argument, make a design argument for why you think this is the best idea to pursue. Are you ever asked to prove it? No. All, because you can't. You cannot prove that any design will be great. All you can do is make an argument for it and then try it, right? And modify it if it doesn't work, et cetera. So you're taught, I would argue, the foundational skills in design school for the part of the world where things can be other than they are. And you're taught the foundational skills in business school for the part of the world that cannot be other than it, it, than it is. Unfortunately, most of business is the other part, right? Uh, and again, this is part of science envy. It comes from 1959-60 when the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller, uh, or the um, uh, Ford Foundation and the Carnegie Foundation studied U uh, U.S. business education and said, you got to get more scientific, more right. rigorously scientific. Right. And it drove it, it drove it in a direction that's, that's been flat out terrible for for uh, business education, but it's now self-reinforcing, which is unless unless you use you know uh, intense uh, analytical quantitative methods in your research, uh, and you never get published, and you're never going to get a job in a business school. So all the people who are in business schools are kind of quantitatively uh, oriented, or they'll be ejected out of out of business schools, and so it's self-reinforcing. That's why. That's why it's going to have to have a big collapse uh, uh, before it comes uh, comes back. Hopefully, it it will. But if you're well, diversified in undergrad education, you will survive the 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 collapse. Yeah, I think the 
I think the timing of, of and thank you for uh, articulating that again. I think the timing in terms of where we're at going in from a, a broader global economic perspective, the fundamentals aren't making sense to a lot of people. Yes. Um, the data is not making sense. So I, I do believe perhaps that people are going to be leaning leaning into this a bit more in, in the near future uh, because they're, they're forced to in some instances. But, I, but again, I thank you for painting a very clear picture on this because I think it's 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 hugely important for people to consider this this better and different way of looking things. So thank you, Roger. It's my pleasure. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me on your podcast. I appreciate it.